Good morning, Mr. Notice McConaughey. Good morning. Uh, so please, the court, uh, Edward Notice McConaughey here for uh, Kevin O'Brien, the plaintiff uh, at the trial court and uh, the uh, successful party at the trial court by way of a jury verdict. This case is about the standard of review on appeal from a jury verdict. When reviewed here by that standard, the jury's verdict in this case must be upheld. The standard is whether anywhere in the evidence any combination of circumstances can be found which would support reasonable inference in favor of the jury's verdict for Mr. O'Brien. When viewed by this standard, the judgment for Mr. O'Brien must be upheld. This is a case involving a jury's determination of a breach of fiduciary duty. This was uh, evidence of the ultimate effort to freeze out a minority shareholder and the ultimate uh, facts supporting a finding of breach of fiduciary duty. And I say that because, first and foremost, the majority shareholders denied that Mr. O'Brien was a shareholder at all. They attempted to freeze him out as a shareholder, and they did that in connection with corporate meetings and corporate minutes, and at trial, they denied that he was a 48% shareholder at all. The brief that has been submitted on behalf of Wait Mr. Pearson. Can I, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yes. I thought there were some uh, minutes, uh, corporate minutes that reflected that he was a 48% shareholder. Yes, Your Honor, and that's precisely one of my points, which is uh, when the whole issue about the two-thirds vote for selling the uh, only corporate asset came up, there was a meeting. It was a director's meeting and a shareholder's meeting. Uh, Mr. O'Brien attended that meeting, and Mr. Pearson and Mr. Palm produced proposed minutes of a shareholder's meeting. Those minutes uh, showed him as a 48% shareholder. No actual uh, meeting took place uh, and no vote took place, and those minutes were never signed. However, at trial, they denied that he was a 48% shareholder. This was all placed in front Did of the jury. Did they deny the existence of those proposed minutes? They did not, Your Honor. And it, it, is, it is our view, and our, I suggest that the jury, having received the draft minutes showing that he was a 48 percent shareholder, those minutes having been prepared by Mr. Pearson and Mr. Palm, and then for them at trial to take the stand and testify that he was not a shareholder and for his counsel to take the position that he was not a shareholder was evidence of their frame of mind and the way they were treating Mr. O'Brien. On the one hand, when it was convenient for them, they would take the position he was a shareholder. At trial, when it became obvious there was a dispute, they denied he was a shareholder. Mr. That, Not Mr. Notice McCarthy, uh, forgive me, could I ask you this question? Um, in its decision, in the appeals court um, characterizes the breach of fiduciary duty, the breach, as uh, the refusal of the defendants, quote, to press forward with an acquisition. Now, clearly, the letter agreement committed them to certain things, provided that it was economically feasible. So what precisely did they not do that constitutes a breach of fiduciary duty? Your Honor, the appeals court did make that specific finding. No, they're just characterizing your argument at that point. Right. So, so, what, so when, when you say to me, this is what they didn't do. Okay. What they didn't do was, uh, first, they didn't agree that Mr. O'Brien was a 48% shareholder. They didn't agree that he was entitled to 48% of the proceeds of the sale of the note. Uh, they didn't provide him with financial information uh, concerning the corporation. Uh, they didn't uh, give him his right to oppose and prevent the sale of the only corporate asset under Section 75 of 156B, and they didn't honor the original agreement of the parties with regard to why this company was set up in the first place. And in what respect did they not honor the original agreement? All the parties agreed that the purpose that this, for this corporation to be set up 
was to obtain the note, uh, which they did do, and to use it as leverage to gain control over the development and to develop the property. Good. All parties agreed to that. There was extensive testimony uh, to that effect below. And that ties in, Your Honor, with uh, the fundamental finding of the Wilkes versus uh, Springside Nursing Home case, which is that the test of a breach of fiduciary duty. No, no, I, know, I know what the test is. I'm just asking you what they didn't do. What they didn't do, Your Honor, was uh, they purchased the note and the mortgage, yeah. which we. I know, I know what they did. Yes, okay. What they didn't do then was to go back to the Shelseys and uh, insist to the Shelseys, we have the note. Uh, we control those nine lots. You have to deal with us, and we have to, you have to make an arrangement with us for the sale of this property, and these are the terms on which we will do it. I and thought they did do that. I thought, they, they, I thought they, they made an overture and said, we will forgive the debt you pay us 250000 Am I correct? They had one round of negotiations? They did not, Your Honor. What? The evidence was that, that they went out and hired a consultant, Right. who approached the Shelseys, and that he never actually made an offer to purchase the property. The evidence was from Mr. Kahn, the consultant, that he had told the she left the Shelseys with the impression on purpose that Pearson and Palm, that this uh, company was not really interested in isn't purchasing that, the property. Isn't that the whole point here, that at that point he somewhat discouraged uh, the Shelseys from thinking that uh, they were interested in purchasing this property? Yes. The evidence, uh, Your Honor, is that essentially as soon as they engaged in this venture, Pearson and Palm abandoned the purpose and never really made any kind of a good faith effort to follow through to negotiate with the Shelseys to purchase this property. So you're saying to me that if I look at the evidence, there was no negotiation, there was no offer, there was no saying we want to buy give me your best offer, or we want to buy on these terms. Correct, Your Honor. That, that is the case. And, in fact, the consultant uh, was never informed about the letter agreement uh, between Mr. Uh, O'Brien and Pearson and Palm, did not know Mr. O'Brien was involved in the entire transaction, and was not given instruction by Pearson and Palm to go and attempt to purchase, to use this note and mortgage, to attempt to leverage it into control uh, and ownership of that parcel. What does he parcel. think he was doing? He was looking for the best outcome that he could get for this company with the note and mortgage. He talked about uh, risk, uh, avoiding risk. He talked about getting what he considered to be the best result from them from the note and mortgage and concluded early on that using it to, uh, to uh, get a purchase price for the note and mortgage was the best outcome uh, for Pearson and Palm, and that's what he pursued. Uh, so that is, uh, that is the testimony, and, Your Honor, and the jury could well have believed it. Was there any evidence, um, Mr. Notice McConaughey, that your client, Mr. O'Brien, uh, had he not reached an agreement with, um, uh, with Pearson and Palm, that he would have sought out other financing opportunities? Uh, that did not come up, Your Honor, okay. and the reason uh, was that uh, Mr. O'Brien testified that he had a prior relationship with Mr. Pearson, and when he had the opportunity, he took it directly to Mr. Pearson. So he went to him first? Yes. The, the facts, the, just for clarity, the facts are that when the consultant uh, I interacted with the, uh, I guess their name is Schultzies or? Shelsey. Shelsey's and, and uh, gave them the impression that uh, they were not interested in purchasing, they turned to another group who did purchase. Correct. Can I ask you a question about damages? I take it your theory of damages was lost profits. Correct, Your Honor. And, and how do you get over the, the white spot construction company versus jet spray? Uh, it seems to me that the profits here are very speculative. Yeah. Uh, several things, Your Honor. One is that uh, there was a specific instruction uh, by the judge to the jury, and uh, that specific instruction told the, uh, the uh, jury that they could award the plaintiff his proportionate share of any lost business profits, 
that he had proved with reasonable certainty or that was caused by the breach. That instruction to the jury was not objected to. The jury was told that they could consider uh, lost business profits without objection. Then you go to the next step, Your Honor, and say, what was, was there a reasonable nexus between these damages and the actions of the defendants? There was extensive, very practical testimony from a number of witnesses at trial, including Mr. O'Brien, using the defendant's own uh, projections and expert testimony as well, uh, which supported uh, a finding by the jury that it was uh, quite reasonable that they could have uh, used this note and mortgage to obtain control over this property, that they could have uh, built the roads and built out these houses. And there was, in fact, testimony from the uh, party who did purchase the property that all of those steps were taken. Uh, and uh, so I think, Your Honor, there but was... In white spray, I mean, it, it, the court really seems to suggest there are all kinds of damages you might be able to collect, but when it comes to lost profits, it can't be just some general sense that there's probably a lot of money involved, but it has to be a very specific uh, accounting of how those profits uh, and certainty with respect to those profits. And in, in jet spray, in fact, they, the contract was for the person to build something and get, you know, for a hundred and estimates between 140 and 160,000 and would get 10 percent of that as a profit. And the court said the evidence wasn't sufficient that someone else came in and built it for 161,000 because maybe it was a different building, a different type of building. I mean, how do we know what kind of houses would have been built here? How do we, how do we know any of that with any certainty at all? Well, you know, what we do have here are projections that were prepared by the defendants themselves in anticipation of all of this. And those, those projections uh, were presented to the jury in a very uh, concrete way, and it had uh, in there uh, their decisions with regard to the size of the houses that were built, the kind of houses, what they would cost, and so it was the defendant's own testimony about what they expected realistically could be done with this property. Well, I know that in, in this case, <coughs> the same case, they, they projected at a, you know, at a certain cost, and therefore their profits, let's say they projected it at 150000 their profits would have been 15000 Someone came out, else came in and built it for 161000 and the court said, well, that's just not specific enough. I mean, how, how do you get around this? We just, does this just not apply to this case, white spray, I mean, uh, uh, white spot? Your Honor, I, uh, our case was a jury case. I don't frankly remember uh, whether or not that was a ju jury determination. Our case not only had the defendant's own projections, it had Mr. O'Brien's own testimony. And I will point out, Your Honor, that Mr. O'Brien himself testified to the, all of the information about the lost profits without any objection whatsoever I think from the defendants. I think made how much money based on how many homes to be developed? Correct. How many homes were there to be developed? Sixty. Sixty or sixty lots, Your Honor. I believe that's right. So he went through and, and determined it. Uh, and again, there was no objection to that testimony going before the jury. Then we, to make sure that we were giving no the jury. And no objection to the instruction. Correct. Then to make sure that we were on solid ground, Your Honor, we had an expert come in. And that expert took standard estimating uh, procedures uh, to determine what the lost profits would be, what the costs would be. And we submitted that testimony to the jury. Then there was actual testimony, some of it brought in by the defendants, about what actually happened at the property. And all of that was, uh, so there were three or four different ways. Hey, did they object to that testimony? The, in terms of the expert, Your Honor? No, in terms of what actually happened. No, actually, they didn't. Uh, they actually brought in uh, the person who purchased the property, who testified to the cost of the roads. Uh, and uh, so that was, uh, in fact, uh, brought in uh, by them, Your Honor. I believe they did testify to whether or not they did object and, and argue that the, that the figures were speculative as to the building of the houses. Yeah. But some of it was brought in uh, by their own witnesses. The, the, this court decided the... Uh, Brody case just uh, in December in terms of uh, uh, the breach of fiduciary duty and damages. That was a case that had to do with remedy. As I went back through that Brody case, the evidence there that supported the breach of fiduciary duty and the finding of breach of fiduciary duty was far less compelling than the testimony we have here and the evidence we have here. 
There it was a refusal to share financial information of the company. We have refusal to provide financial information, refusal to hold corporate meetings, refusal to allow Mr. O'Brien to participate in meetings with the Shelseys, the uh, sale of the primary and only asset of this corporation uh, in violation of 156B, Section 75. Uh, we have the denial of the fact that he's a shareholder, and we have uh, the um, fact that they didn't honor this agreement. So all of these uh, would be something the jury could consider from which sufficient inferences could be drawn in favor of this verdict. And I would ask the court to uphold the jury's verdict and the judgment entered by the trial court. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Mr. Connerty. Mr. King. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honors, may it please the court. This case involved two uh, errors of law uh, that could be addressed on the appeal, uh, appeal level and one of them was addressed uh, below at the appeals court level. Uh, the verdict cannot stand as it ignores established law in two areas. One uh, you've heard on both of them today, first one being the fiduciary duty area and the second one being in the area of damages. There's a long line of uh, decisional law in both areas which we'll touch on, of course, it's covered in the briefs. Um, bottom line is both are questions of law and are ripe for uh, dis decision in, uh, on appeal to overturn the verdict. Uh, either one in, uh, alone is sufficient to overturn the verdict. Uh, as I noted, the appeals court uh, stopped at the breach of fiduciary duty level, uh, and in the decision basically encapsulates the outcome here by saying that there is no law out there, no support out there in the fiduciary duty law that would support a finding of a breach where there was no self-dealing, no fraud, no disproportionate treatment that disadvantaged the minority shareholder or treated the minority shareholder. Mr. In King, a, yes. here's, here's my problem. There's no question as to what the intent here was. In other words, it wasn't as if um, <clears throat> these were three college roommates who decided to set up a small corporation to go, you know, make some software. Here you have Mr. O'Brien going to some people and saying, I have an opportunity for us to get this to develop the property, correct? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> um, the piece of the appeals court argument that seemed to me to, to raise questions was what was brought out by my, the answer to my question by Mr. Notice McConaughey, which is there was no offer made to purchase it, nor did they ask uh, the Shelseys what they would take, correct? Your Honor, I, don't, I do not know exactly what the evidence below was as well, to whether or not. you should know what the evidence I, let, me, let, me, let me explain. Um, there is, uh, I believe, conflicting testimony as to exactly what um, the Yes, and the that's, for the, that's for the jury to decide. Correct. So what the appeals court says, um, the argument appears to be the defendants could have made the Shelseys an offer that was reasonable to both sides. I don't think that that's what the claim is. The claim is you said that we would enter into a closely held corporation in order to buy the property. You then do nothing. You hire a consultant and you say to the consultant, get me the most money on this note. That is not what the plaintiff said. He, that was not the purpose of the corporation. He didn't agree to that. He wasn't consulted about that. What he wanted to do was to attempt using the note to get the right to develop the property, not unreasonable because that was his business, correct? Correct, Your Honor. I mean, he's not in the business of buying up um, overdue notes and trying to get the most amount of money on them. He's in the business of using a financial instrument to leverage his ability to get a property. Who, who are you talking about, Your Honor? You're talking about Mr. O'Brien? Uh, I don't believe there's any uh, evidence that that's his, uh, his business uh, model. I believe he's in the no, business, not his business of model, but that's clear what they what they said. Clearly, the original goal of this enterprise Correct. was to acquire the entirety of all uh, and, parcels. And your clients did nothing to further that goal without consulting him. That, that is not correct, Your Honor. The first thing they did in, to further the goal was to spend their own cash, $100,000, to acquire a note. Yes, that was part of the agreement. Okay, and that note might have become uncollectible and worth less than 100. So it right might away, have, it might have, and the purpose was to use that as leverage to get access correct. to what they all agreed was a 
worthwhile prospect to pursue, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And in, the, in going forward with that plan, they are entitled where there was no contractual obligation that they actually go through with the acquisition. In no. Fact, there could not be one this because... Is, this is not because, it, you know, as long as it's reasonable. But they had an obligation they undertook to attempt to acquire the property, not for some unreasonable price, or to consult with the minority shareholder about changing the objectives. Correct, Your Honor. And, and it is our position that in the exercise of their good business judgment, they did approach the Shelseys through their consultant, they did approach and try to figure out, gauge the situation, and figure out what was the best time to make a move. Unfortunately, Premier arrives and makes an offer. Did they ever go and say, we'll make a better offer? I think it was apparent to the Shelseys. I'm, I'm confident it was apparent to the Shelseys and the evidence which support that Pearson, Palm, and Summerhill Enterprise with Mr. O'Brien were a potential buyer of the entire uh, area. Uh, the entire did they say process. so? Excuse me? Did they so testify? The, the record, as I said, is, is, I think, foggy on exactly what Mr. Kahn said to the Shelseys. Uh, it is clear that at one point he says, well, would you buy the note back? Okay, and, and, no, and would that, you buy the note back is different. But I, I asked Mr. Notice McConaughey, and he said they never made an offer to purchase the property, and they never said, make us an offer. If you want to, now, you, you can change your mind and decide – you know, you, your consultant says, hey, this is a good opportunity to make a quick 300%. You can do that if you go to your minority shareholder and say, do you have any objection to this? This is a quick turnaround. Let's go look for some other properties. That's fine. Your Honor, there was no requirement that they rush out the day they bought this note and, and make an offer. There was no schedule set. There was no plan of attack that was agreed upon. Instead, the decision was using good business judgment. This is a negotiation. They're not going to go out and say, we want it, we want it so badly, here's $5 million. No, no this is a negotiation. It has to be timed properly. You gauge the players, and you wait for the right time to strike with your offer. Their good business judgment was, let's sit back and see how this plays out. Uh, unfortunately, Premier came Isn't in. Isn't that viewing them. the evidence in the light most favorable to you? No, Your Honor, I believe that's that's – that's the reality. In fact, uh, Mr. O'Brien uh, testified that they did nothing for a while. Well, well, didn't the consultant indicate they weren't interested in purchasing? That's the testimony uh, from Mr. O'Brien. That's in the light most favorable to Mr. O'Brien, yes. And that was a, uh, our position is that was a negotiation tactic. Now, if that's the case, you will note at the end of the day the agreement they did sign. Well, well let me just stop you there. Don't we have to look at it in the light most favorable to Mr. O'Brien? Sure you do. And so from his perspective, the consultant indicated they were not interested in purchasing the property. And wasn't that the goal? Wasn't that their agreement to purchase the property? If, if you go as far as believing that that expectation is an actionable expectation, and I believe the evidence is not clear on that, and I'm, I'm, I'm confident the evidence is not clear on that, uh, as evidenced by the Mills Appeals Court's decision, they looked at the evidence and they said, this document, this March 98 agreement, says nothing about acquiring the property. No, of but course, that's the goal to mm -hmm. the whole enterprise. Let me, let me ask you this. As I, and I haven't you know, laid out a chronology here, um, but it says that um, um, uh, where, when, when did um, the consultant – first um, ask, uh, had the negotiation with the Shelseys about the release of the secured debt? Uh, Your Honor, I do not have that date uh, at my fingertips, but I can tell you this. This was fast moving. They bought the note on March 16, 98, the same day they formed right. the, agreement, the, uh, the enterprise. Uh, by m two months later, almost to the day, Premier had entered the agreement to acquire the property. This was a fast-moving um, activity on this property. So sure, that often is the case when somebody's in bankruptcy. And correct. Think, I mean, that's when you move. I mean, you don't wait for correct. five months. I mean, you, they, I, I take it there was no evidence that said we'd agreed on what, what an asking price was, we discussed it. I mean, as I understood, the instructions were to the consultant, go and get me the most amount of money that you can on this note. The evidence is that the consultant came back and said, here's what the Shelseys are looking for. And that dollar value was too high. Pearson and Palm said, that is not a dollar amount we are willing to invest. Fine, so you make a counteroffer. 
instead of which the consultant said, but I've got another way of doing this for you where you'll make a quick turnaround. I'll try and sell you, then I'll try and get them to, to I, pay I would you. suggest, Your Honor, that that is a, a negotiation tactic that you know, you've heard all the time. Buyers come in and say, no, nah, I really don't like this place. I'm not interested in it. If you approach the, uh, the deal with too much uh, eagerness, your, your price is going up. But I take it you made that claim at trial, I assume. I believe it was made, yes, Your Honor. Right, so the jury could consider that Correct. and make a decision Correct. about Correct. that. Correct. I'd like to, if I could, turn to the damages because yeah, I, I do think would. that, that, you know, that one I think is even clearer of, of uh, a basis for tipping this verdict, uh, overturning this verdict. If you go back uh, almost to the turn of the century, starting with the Hetherington case, uh, moving forward to Lowry, uh, moving forward to White Spot, and as recent as uh, two months ago, uh, Your Honor's decided twin fires um, on the uh, IPO stock sale. All of these cases st uh, state that you can't award speculative lost profits in this situation. Did you if you find a breach, there are remedies that you have here. There are, there are damages you can award, uh, and there are ways that you can, you can uh, you know, compensate for that breach. However, to allow the lost profits claim to go overturns all that body of law that says, first of all, what damages are in the contemplation of the parties at the time they enter the arrangement? Second of all, what was the, what was the ability to prove damages with reasonable certainty as of the time of the breach? Mr. King, let me ask you this. Uh, Mr. Notice O'Connor, he said, O'Brien testified as to what he expected to make, no objection. Correct? Your Honor, there were objections as to motions and limited to preclude the experts from testifying as I'm to not the speculative experts. damages. O'Brien, O'Brien, O'Brien stands up and says, this is what I would have been able to make or words to that effect. No objection. Your Honor, I, was, uh, I don't know if there's an objection to that specific statement on the, on the witness stand, but I can tell you that the objections as to, objections were made time and time again as to allowing the lost profits to go forward, and they were overruled, overruled, and, and the well, uh, let's objections take a look were at reserved. Those for a minute. Um, all the local approvals had been obtained, had they not, to build the houses on these lots? The local approvals were obtained. However, um, Mr. O'Brien needed to obtain additional permitting that was uh, in, his, in his offer when he tried to buy the note himself, at a, at a, I might add, at an amount less favorable than the amount Premier, uh, sorry, the Twin Hills was uh, offering to buy it. Uh, the 400. His deal, his proposed uh, acquisition was at a less favorable amount. He uh, but, but had a contingency there. The, um, assuming you could find that the lots were already locally approved to be buildable, um, then isn't it a very simple calculation where you get some evidence of, okay, we're going to build so many houses, we're going to sell them for so much, they're going to cost a, us so much to build, the profit's going to be this, and wasn't all that in re there? Respectfully, Your Honor, not at all. Uh, what happened here is the project that was ultimately built was very different from the project that Pearson, Palm, and O'Brien had envisioned. First of all, the house size was 500 square foot higher on the high end. The sale price was... Oh, I understand that. So you, maybe you go back to what O'Brien said he would have done, right? I mean, in other words... That would directly uh, overrule your decisions in um, the White Spot uh, case. That, that's, that is this case. In White Spot, you had a ready, able, willing build, builder who was kicked off the job. The buyers had agreed to a price and said, yes, come on in and build it. They kicked them off the job. A different building was built, $20,000 more. And they, the, this court said, I'm sorry, that's speculative. You could not establish that that is the price that you would have gotten had you built it. Oh, that's Lost profits are, are rejected in that situation. Uh, in, in the Lowry decision, um, Your Honors, um, my, my, uh, my, my issue goes to what, to what was objected to and where. In other words, what could the jury have found and what were the instructions to the jury? Were the instructions inaccurate? Your Honor, the, the instructions were not inaccurate because they said, what damages do you find with reasonable certainty? And I submit to you that that implies and includes in it, embodies the case law that exists. And that is no speculative damages. Well, did you ask for a specific jury instruction that was rejected? No, Your Honor, that, because that is, the, that is a proper statement of, of the law. And, and the jury said to, and, and then there's evidence. I, I take it that evidence that was objected to was excluded or you saved your objection? Correct. Objections were reserved. It was not excluded. 
but the objections were reserved. And to which particular evidence? The expert? The expert who based his opinions of value on the project as completed four to six years later okay. than the breach. And any other objections? The objections as to the whole line of lost profits were raised and reserved. The evidence came in. Now, you heard that uh, Pearson and Palm put on evidence themselves as to costs because once it was coming in, they had to rebut what was going up on the boards. So, yes, they did put in their own evidence as to lost profit type damages because they had to rebut what was already going in. Did, did the judge have before him um, the jet spray cooler case? Uh, a white, white spot? I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, uh, yes, Your Honor, I believe it was in the briefs. It must, uh, and, so what, and what was his reason for allowing the evidence in? He believed, uh, as he says in his uh, uh, dialogue from the bench, um, that as we've been instructed from the appeals court, so I'm going to let this come in, let the jury decide, and I can fix it after the fact if I think it's necessary. Okay. Thank you, Mr. King. Thank we'll you, take Your Honor. a short break.